This is Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, and Joe Bonney. And um, that's one of the things that I think that's tearing us apart. You know, once once we get home is the moral injury. You know, the things that we do that violate our moral code, which is, you know, this written law that we have that guides, you know, our our our, our behavior, you know, our conscience, you know. And violating that that moral contract that we have with ourselves is what I think that that's that's what getting a lot of people more more than than post traumatic stress disorder because I think post traumatic stress disorder at the end of the day is a it's a fear response you know to a very tra- traumatizing event but moral injury is more about the things that we but that we have a hard time forgiving ourselves for because we didn't do what we were supposed to do or we did nothing when sh- when we should have done something um so coming home for me just basically just gave me the um the safety and the peace of mind to be able to go back to those moral questions no longer on survival mode you know thinking that you know anything that that i do would be my my last action and that's when you face your demons you know when you when you're home and you know nobody's shooting at you and you know um you don't have to deal with improvised explosive devices or indirect fire or anything like that and then you you know, you have to come to terms with what you did. And and for me, that was a really difficult thing. I had a small child. She's 22 now. She was three at the time, four. Um, and I didn't know if I could be a dad to her because of all the things that I had done. You know, I mean, how do you teach a, a, a kid right from wrong when you have done so much wrong yourself? Um, and just like all these questionings, you know, that began to torment me. And eventually, you know, I realized that I was a conscious objector. It was something that I fought mentally because I said, you know, I've already been there. You know, we, we were in combat. We tortured people. We killed people. It's too late for me to be a conscious objector. Not knowing that it's, it's really the very experience of war what really makes you be anti-war. I don't think there's any, anyone who can be more anti-war than a combat veteran, you know, who has actually experienced the horror of war. But I didn't see it that way at the time. You know, I thought that it was too late for me. I was tainted. You know, I was already a bad person. But um, I got some counseling and I started writing a conscientious objector application. And that was a journey for me, a spiritual journey to come to terms with all the bad shit that we had done. And, you know, I, I was able to get over my fear also of what the military would do to me if I spoke out against the war because I began to think about really what humanity had sacrificed and what people were still sacrificing, you know, to oppose war. I came across people like Brian Wilson, you know, who lost his legs trying to stop uh, weapons shipments to Central America uh, back in the days. And, you know, people who had lost everything to war, you know, um, victims of war, victims of landmines that were left behind. Um, And, that gave me perspective, you know, that whatever happened to me could not be as horrible as what so many people had lost or had gone through. And, you know, I, I felt empowered to speak out and, and say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to fight this war. I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, to be a party to, to this supreme war crime against humanity. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to fight your war anymore. And of course, I was the first combat veteran to do that at the time. There were other uh, objectors, you know, you talk, talked about NPR and we have, we have a couple of uh, um, early members of, back then it was called the Iraq Veterans Against the War, but Stephen Funk was one of them, a Marine uh, who came out, out of the closet and out against the wars, which took a lot of, a lot of frigging courage, you know, for a Marine to come out as gay and anti-war. He was actually um, just getting out of jail as I was going through my journey. And then we also had an Air Force captain, Stephen Potts, and he came out on NPR as well uh, before uh, getting deployed. He never got deployed. Uh, but I was the first one to speak from personal experience and, and talk about what was going on in Iraq, on the ground in Iraq. And, and so it was a pretty, pretty big deal, I guess, you know, for, for the media. Um, 
the media was not what it is today. There was still a little bit of objectivity, you know, like the media was not so co-opted as it is now. And, you know, the story got a lot of traction, uh, both in the U.S. and internationally. And I think that that ended up, uh, you know, working to my advantage to have that, you know, that many eyes on my case. And that included Amnesty International, which I'm not a fan of anymore. But uh, back then, you know, they adopted me as a person of conscience and they issued a warning that if I was incarcerated, that they would launch a campaign to secure my, my safety and my release. And, you know, I had a sham of a court martial that lasted three days. You would thought Osama bin Laden was being tried because of the amount of um, uh, security around um, the courthouse. That was in um, Fort Benning, Georgia. No, I'm sorry, Fort Stewart. That was Fort Stewart. And yeah, I was found guilty of desertion. They put me away on a 12-month sentence. I did nine in Fort Seal. And then I got out uh, nine months later and, you know, wrote the book, wrote from Aramadi, which I think you guys have a copy of, and began doing counter recruiting work, joined Iraq Veterans Against the War, Veterans for Peace. And I've been doing um, anti-war organizing and activism ever since.